children. Thank you. It's truly a privilege. And thank you for the way you are challenging us to be like you, which is really what purity is all about. We ask you, Lord, to continue what you are doing, strengthen us with all might. The work you are doing inside of us, let it just go on to the extent you want it, so that we'll be like you. For that's what your plan is at the end of the day in the earth dream is to repopulate the earth with sons, just like Adam was before his fall. Have your way, O oh Lord. We we'll give you all praise and we thank you for everyone flying to Open Gate or driving or coming by any means. Lord, take them safely to the conference. Let it be a holy convocation unto you. By the time we finish on Sunday, let there be this testimony that we met you, we encountered you. We give you praise for the ministry of the blood. We declare it upon the day, upon the night, upon all the days of Open Gate from now to Sunday. Lord, have your way. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen and amen. Men and brethren, by the grace of our Father, He opened up us up this week on a series that was not planned for. Purity. The shortest way for end of the age. We thought it was Monday. Then he said, no, I still have more to say on Tuesday. And on and on. And last night we did number five. And this morning we did number six. Will it end today? I have no idea. But lost him. Yesterday, the Lord was telling about some dimensions of purity he wanted to do, and he was trying to articulate them. The first one was in the heart, the dimension of the heart, that the Lord wants to possess the heart. The heart is the heart of the matter. Whatever possesses the heart, from the heart proceeds everything. Righteousness, I mean, sinful conduct, holy conduct, it proceeds from the heart. That's what the Lord said in Matthew chapter 7. The heart is the heart of the matter. So the heart, once the Lord possesses it, there's a dramatic change. And this is what the Lord is saying to us in this season. Give me, my, give me your heart. My son, give me your heart. I want to do a work in it. And remember yesterday night, and I wanted to check that tape. I believe the Lord made some profound revelations. He spoke about how believers can backslide, or even apostatize. And, they, and we're in that season when apostasy is so heavy. People are falling out of the faith. And what is the key? It was what he told us in the book of Second Peter chapter 1 from verse 5. Things to add to our faith. And the reality is that if we don't add those things to our faith, that person who is not added, adding will be blind, will forget he was saved, and begin to do other things. And Paul said, we'll turn, be a turn aside into vain jangling. And there are people born again, spirit filled, but their heart is caked. Years of not growing has led to a situation where they are static or regressing. The yesterday the Lord spoke to us about the mind. The second thing, the mind. The mind is where thoughts are processed where thoughts are generated and thoughts are processed. You know, if the mind is pure, then everything will be pure because as one thinks, so is one. As Proverbs 23, 7 says, we are told to therefore bring our mind for the Lord to renew it by his word, to take away the cultures of the world we came with, the background we grew up in, the type of the parts of the city we grew up in. The various postcodes and zip code areas of the cities we grow up in, those things affect how we see life, affect our perspective. Let's say, bring it. I want to take the world to chalk out every worldly way of thinking, worldly perspective, so that we can have the mind of Yeshua, the mind of Jesus. The third one is emotions. The Lord wants to deal with emotions. Emotions come about by what we experience in life, words spoken to us, actions taken against us, attitudes we experience, emotions are reflexive responses to external stimuli. The emotion is a component of the soul, it's part of the soul. And what happens is that many times in life, when the emotion is not dealt with and sanctified, 
the emotion is full of abrasions and lesions, full of, you know, lacerations that came about by what we experienced, what somebody said, what somebody did. Some of the emotional issues come up right from the time the baby is in the womb. Let's say a young, let's say a lady married a man and the, the you know, then the man began to batter her when she was in pregnancy. Rejection, battering, all these things combined. That that negative state the woman is emotionally can be transmitted to the child. And so some people come out to the world with those transmitted emotional impulses. But the majority of emotions are those that come about by what people do what people say, what people live, how they respond to issues. The result is some people's emotions are raw. A little thing, they're off. A little thing reinforces their sense of rejection, their sense of, of not being good enough. And there are people who think they are not good enough. It affects people. They are born again, spirit filled, but their emotions are raw. They are damaged. Their emotions are lacerated. So much lesions are on the emotion, just as you have lesions on the body when there's a whipping. So also some emotions have so much lesions, and people are carrying these emotional baggages. They want to serve the Lord. It doesn't work. They want to relate with people. It doesn't work. They can misread. The bad emotion can misread thoughts of other people, words of other people. It will assume what people are thinking of you. And that's a dangerous place to be, to assume what people are thinking. Men and brethren, emotions can draw us down. And in these days, the Lord says, bring the emotion to me. I want to do a work of grace in it. I want to do some healing in the emotion. I want to do some deliverance of the emotion. And it can come about by truth that is declared. Truth that challenges us to consider. Shall I remain an emotional baggage? Shall I remain bottled up with all this raw emotion? If the Lord comes now, somebody who is in that kind of emotional state may miss the sound of the trumpet because he's in a state of emotional low. Men and brethren, the emotion is so important to understand. The Lord said, First Thessalonians 5, 22, 23 to 24, the very Elohim of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, Elohim, your spirit, soul, and body shall be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord. It's about the coming of the Lord. The Lord is able to heal every damaged emotion, every wounded emotion, every emotion that is lacerated by what it has experienced, by what was imparted from childhood, by what is imparted from the environment. Somebody who grew up in a home that was full of crisis and confusion, and there was somebody, a child who grew up, Anything she, he or she asked for, it was never given. Everything, no. We don't have money. We can't afford it. All that. She sees a lot other children having those things, buying those things. You know what? That thing can make that child begin to develop a negative view of life. And so the Lord wants to deal with the emotions. It's still sanctification by the blood, by the word, by the spirit. The Lord wants to do a deep work of grace upon the emotions. Men and brethren, we cannot follow the wise. It's important that we avoid carrying emotional baggages into the end of the age. It can hold you back. The fourth one is the tongue. The tongue, when it's not sanctified, it can be a war. It can, it can set everything on fire. Set relationships on fire. It can destroy everything. Tongue, unsanctified, it can issue bile, issue poison. It's acidic. The tongue needs to be sanctified. The Lord wants to sanctify the tongue of his people. The book of James tells us about unsanctified tongue. Very dangerous, very deadly. It can do a lot of damage. Gossip, backbiting, evil speaking, malicious words, all kinds of things can come out from it. People are born again, spirit filled, yet the tongue, because they didn't ever think it's necessary. The Lord says it's necessary. The Lord wants to sanctify the tongue of his people so that what comes out 
from a sanctified heart come out through a sanctified tongue can, can it can truly bless. Remember Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah went into the temple. The national prophet of Israel, he saw the glory of Elohim high and lifted up. The glory of Elohim was like a mirror that showed him the unsanctified tongue. And he said, Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. And Elohim sent an angel who took tongues from the coals from the altar in the heavenlies and touched his lips and sanctified. Today, the Holy Spirit is available. Today, the word is available. Today, the blood is available to sanctify the people. To make tongues, to bring forth wholesome words, words that build up, words that are spoken in love, words that are powerful, words that convey the presence and the mind of Elohim. When the tongue is not sanctified and begins to talk about so much things and filthy things and negative things, things that are not edifying, things that are not encouraging, and things that are sultry, things that are totally, you know, it border on the serve on the crude. And people do coarse jokes in ministry. You cannot afford it. Behold, he comes. Watch, pray, occupy. In watching, we need to ask the Lord to set a seal on our tongue. Apart from when the Lord wants to use it for his purpose, let the tongue be sealed. Let it receive a lock. It doesn't just run, run, run. Talking about things it doesn't know. Men and brethren, the tongue is to be sanctified. Number five is the attitude. Attitudes proceed from emotion. Attitudes are also impulsive, reflexive, you know, emissions from the emotions regarding situation. Attitudes can be negative. It can be positive. Men and brethren, People, you know, what they have like pride is an attitude. Superiority complex is an attitude. Snobbishness is an attitude. An attitude of entitlement. An attitude that, you know, attitude is unspoken, but is the way things are done. The message it conveys to people around is how you know the attitude. And the attitude, when they are negative, people cannot stick together. When they are negative, people cannot even draw near. When they are negative, people cannot have encouragement or challenge to go forward. And the Lord wants to do. Fearfulness can be an attitude issue. Low self-esteem, just as emotion, it can also be a product of attitude. And why, what do we mean? When people have a low self-esteem, they tend to lash out. They tend to think that others are, have what they don't have and therefore they begin to be negative towards them. May I bring the Lord wants to do a work of grace in the area of attitude so that it can be pure, it can be clean. Men and brethren, the Lord also wants to do a work of grace in the arena of motives. Motives. Motive is the reason why we say, the reason why we do, the reason why we think, why we, how we think. Actions are cheap. Motives are superior. The Lord is interested in the motive behind what you do. And if the motive is impure, one cannot say he's preparing for the end of the age. If what you do is agenda-driven, the Bible says, let love be without dissimulation. If you're going to do good, do it because you're doing it as obedient to the Lord. You're doing it as unto the Lord. You are serving us unto the Lord, not for, not for attention. You are not doing to be seen, not to be known. A lot of people do things only when there is prominence there. If they are going to read the word of prominence, if they are going to be called to the microphone, you know that sickness called microphonesis. It's a bog in the body of Yeshua. Microphonesis is a big bog. People want to be seen on the microphone, including those who have the gift of speaking and those who don't have the gift of speaking, when you understand ministry, there are people who are called to front line. There are people who are called to supportive. There are people who are called to the back room. And they are yet they are as important as those to the call to the front. This is everybody. Everybody wants to be seen. Everybody wants to be heard. 
motives. If you do ministry because you want to be seen and heard, it corrupts everything you are doing. Any good deed you did, if you want to be glorified, want to be known for that, want to be acknowledged for that, then there's no reward. Because the reward you gain is that acknowledgement of men. If that's what was your motive. And you know something I can tell you. The greatest givers, you don't even hear about them. They don't even want it. They don't need the baggage of publicity. The greatest givers, those who, who do real great things in the kingdom, they are quiet. When they even give, they say, look, look, this, this, is, this is private. This is private. So men and brethren, the Bible says in Colossians 3, 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do it all as unto the Lord. Then from verse 23, 24, whatever good you do, you know you receive the reward from the Lord. When your motive is driven by what people will see, what people will assume, what people will give you back, applause and praise of men, you got your reward already. Based on the principle Yeshua articulated in Matthew chapter 6, you got your reward. If it's prayer, hey, that brother is a prayer warrior. That brother, I mean, the church, everybody knows you as a prayer warrior. That's your reward. That reputation is your reward. Meanwhile, there's another person who transacts with heaven. In real time, on time, transacts with heaven. And because of that person, the Lord answers. And nobody knows. Elohim knows. He who knows his secret is going to reward openly. Motives. The Father wants to sanctify motives. To come to the place. The whole idea of purity is to come to a place where everything in us, within and without, is wholesome, is pure, is clean. There's no dark spot. No gray area. Men and brethren, it's such a glorious thing the Lord is calling us to. He said, this is the highest insurance policy you can buy. Oh, it's greater than buying American life insurance or British life insurance or whatever insurance. The greatest insurance to enter the end of the age, the upper phase of the end of the age we have entered is the insurance of purity within and everything about you. There's no dark part. Why? Elohim, his eyes are purer than to behold iniquity. He knows the motives. He sees the motives. So your words don't matter. Your actions don't matter. The motives that drives it matters to him. And if your heart is rightly inclined, if the mind is rightly inclined, the Lord can give you great rewards, greater than what you put in. The other thing the Lord wants us to do is actions. Actions. Actions we take. Listen. No matter how much you are tempted, no matter how you are tossed to and fro, at the end of the day, the action you took is going to stand to accuse you or to excuse you. Your actions will stand to accuse or excuse you. And so, actions can be good or bad. Actions can be negative or positive. And now, when you take a negative action or a good action, listen to this. When you repeat it, it becomes a habit. When you repeat it, it becomes a lifestyle. And when it becomes a lifestyle, it's settled. You don't have to think. You don't have to plan. You don't have to plot. You don't have to even have a motive. It just comes out from you like that. And there are many actions of people that have come because they took a wrong turn somewhere. It could be a strange doctrine, like, okay, eternal security, whatever you do, the Lord will not count it against you at the end of the day. They took it while in college, and that thing has entered into their psyche, and then they begin to gravitate towards some of those people who are preaching it today on television in different ways. Before you know it, people don't think their actions have consequence. Men and brethren, listen to this. Actions have consequence. The one who is the Elohim of grace, the one who is the Elohim of grace, seated on the throne of grace, dispensing grace, whose love is so awesome, he is still the righteous judge. And when you set aside his word and go to your own word to do what you want, one will come before him. And I told that Yeshua, the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Verse 10, we must all come before the judgment seat of Yeshua. For those who are born again till they die, is a judgment seat. 
where a lot of things, our motives, our actions, our, our choices we made, the opportunities we took, are going to come before him. That will determine the kind of crowns, the kind of thrones, the kind of you know, rewards that will come. And for all believers, actions will lead them to the lake of fire. Actions will lead them to the great white throne judgment that will end with the lake of fire judgment where they will be in eternal torment. Actions that are also good proceeding out of encounter with the Lord's salvation and from their growth in grace, the action will lead one to eternal joy and eternal happiness, eternal satisfaction with the Father, eternal relationship with the Father that was the essence of the blood. That's what the blood wanted to secure. People are going to live with Elohim forever and ever. Actions matter. That's why Romans chapter 6 tells us from verse 12 to 16 that at the end of the day, actions will be a function of who you submitted to. We are members of our body. We have our feet. We have our mouth. We have our hands. We have our eyes. Who do you submit to as you are on the internet? What do you do? When you see negative pictures, they can come in a moment. What do you do? Do you dwell on it? Then it will pollute you. It will enter the gates of your eyes. You hear negative things going on. Do you still keep your ears open? It will enter the gates of the ears. But if the, the righteous action of shutting down that television, changing the channel, of getting away from places where negative things are done, those actions are going to stand before you. You go to a salon, all the talk is against men. Men are wicked, men are evil. And the thing is eating you up. You don't know when you begin to act out what you used to hear. You have a feet that will refuse to go to where iniquity. The Bible says, blessed is the one who does not sit in the council of the ungodly. Who does not stand in a part of people who are unbelievers or who have negative mindset or who take counsel from them. You have a choice to choose. Listen to me. It's only blood, brothers and sisters. You have no choice who, where you're born into. You have choice about your friends. If your friends, if their lifestyle will take you to eternal damnation, you place them at the outer court. Yeshua had different realms of influence. He had John, his most intimate friend. He had Peter, James, and John, his core. He had the 12 disciples, his inner circle. He had the 70 sent to her by two. He had the 120 who obeyed him to the upper room. And he had the innumerable crowd who came to eat bread. Brothers and sisters, time comes. And now is the time to begin to check the people. Begin to place gossips on the outer circle. Begin to place people, you know, who are always malicious in their innuendos and all that. Place them aside. Love them. But don't let them be in a position to pour poison into you. Actions matter. Take action. When Gideon had a word of truth about his identity, had a word of truth about adultery in Israel, he went to his father's house and he laid the axe at the root and began to uproot all the idols. Actions are important. Actions are important. Your foundation matters. It's very important. Constantly deal with your foundations. But where foundations are faulty, what shall the righteous do? Then let's take the final one, number eight. The will. The Lord wants to deal with our will. The will of believers is sacrosanct. The Lord doesn't force his will upon us. He declares his will in his word. He declares his will through prophetic utterance or through an exposition like this. The will is, as a matter of fact, the key to every action. What do you do with your will? You know what Yeshua told his disciples in John chapter 4? Yeshua told them something very mind-blowing in verse 22. I have food to eat which you don't know of. Say, has somebody brought him food? Say, my food is to do the will of the Father. John 4, 34. To do the will of the Father who sent me and to finish it. What is driving you, men and brethren? What drives you? Is it your will? Your, your will is your ambition. Your will is your plan. But there's a will of Elohim. The Lord says he wants to 
and he wants us to encounter him afresh and drop our vision, drop our plans and purposes and take his will as the mandate of our life. And when his will becomes the mandate of our life, we begin to be like Yeshua in John 6, 30 and John 6, uh, John 5, 30 and John 6, 38. So I didn't come down from heaven to do my own will. But the will of him that sent me. Can you say I didn't? I wasn't born in America. I wasn't born in Europe. I wasn't born in UK. I wasn't born in Africa. I wasn't born in Asia to come and do my own will. The Lord did not beget you by the blood to follow your own agenda and your plans and purposes. The Lord wants to use our vessels and he's waiting for the day we are going to surrender. We there we are do we realize that look all this trying, all this scheming, all this plotting, all this trying to be this and that. Oh, we go to that seminar, our mind blows up. Somebody comes with a secular humanistic theor uh, theory about how to make money. Some of it are inherently ungodly, in the sense that they glorify mammon. Believers sign up, pursue it as if it were all. Say no. Seek first the kingdom and its righteousness. All other things shall be added to you. How many people have put themselves in a position where they seek the kingdom and the righteousness? The righteousness is this kind of thing we are talking about. That even in business, men and brethren, we run business. I'm not talking to you from a stranger. I was business. I ran business and ministry together. From 1988 till about 2005. I ran my business. And ran ministry. And men and brethren listened to me. I remember one day I went into a local government area in Imo State of Nigeria to take payment from a job I was doing. I was doing a yearbook for the local government area. And the treasurer said, when I entered after we prayed, bound, decreed, broke everything in the realm of the spirit with team of intercessors. I left early, was there first thing. I got into the office. He looked up from the desk and saw me. Say, yes, I said, I've come to take payment. That has been approved. Say, well, you've settled others. I think I'm not in the treasurer. I say, sir, look, listen to me. I'm a Christian. I'm not just a Christian. I'm truly born again. And I'm a minister of the gospel. I don't give bribes. I don't take. I don't do kick forward. I don't kick backward. Brethren, I've run, I've gone into real in those days multi-million businesses, and I never gave a kick back or a kick forward or a sidekick. It is doable. The man paused for a few minutes, looked up and said, Okay. He signed the voucher. I can tell you testimonies. Some of the greatest clients I got, I never went looking for them. I remember the owner of the largest audiovisual company, the largest transport company, I mean the most modern. He came to my office one day, we came back from a retreat, minister's uh, retreat of the, of the ministry. Came in to met me on the porch. He said, George, I've heard of you. I want you to be my consultant. This is a man that bank managers, you know, directors of banks go to him to beg him to take loan. Came. That same anointing is still possible. When I see people, and we're talking about these things, they think it's not, they think it's not feasible. It is feasible. Righteousness. The issue is your will. What is the inclination of our will? Yeshua HaMashiach. Even unto death, in Matthew 26, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed and asked the Father, let this cup pass away from me. Father said, son, this is why you came on earth. Consider those will be redeemed by the blood you shed. Consider the joy that will come after your crown be restored. Go ahead. After some time, the thought of those nails hit him. The Bible says, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. But at the garden of Gethsemane, he said, not my will, but thy be done. How many of us can say, nevertheless, Lord, let your will be done? How many of us will this year drop our will? These things we have pursued for years. This pattern, with all the crisis and confusion, is not working. 
You are a believer. You are born again. You are spirit filled. The least thing you need to do is to drop your will so that his will will take over. And it takes an encounter of purity inside. An encounter in the will where the Lord says, surrender your will to me and trust me. I'll take care of you. I want to guide you. Holy Spirit is given to guide us as many as are led by the Spirit of Elohim. They are the sons of Elohim. Brothers and sisters, if in addition to the two we did yesterday and these six we are doing now, these eight dimensions of the dealings of the Lord, our heart, our mind, our emotions, our tongue, our attitude, our actions, our will, and our motives. If we surrender to his dealings, we are going to come out of the encounter spotless. We're going to be the Omega Church, the bright, radiant Omega Church without spot or wrinkle that is ready for the return of the King of Kings. Brothers and sisters, it's doable. Don't let anybody confuse you that holiness is not doable. It's not a denominational thing. Oh, those holiness denominations. No, holiness is the nature of Elohim. Holiness is the character of Elohim. And holiness is the name of his true dwelling place. Holiness, grace, love. These things are intrinsic in him. And the Lord says, I want to impart it fully into my people. The DNA is already in us. It starts with righteousness. He gives to us the gift of justification, whereby he blotted out our sin and counts us as never have sinned. The problem is that many believers don't grow. They stay there. They begin to regress. Then with time, Second Peter chapter 1 says, they begin to forget that they were delivered from their sins. Why? Their mind is darkened. And the Lord is saying, early in the year, today, the third day of year 2020, it is possible to start this day aright by surrendering all the elements of our being. These are the things that make us who we are to him. And we can, like Paul the Apostle, mighty man, powerful man, the day he encountered Yeshua, he surrendered, who are you, Lord? He acknowledged the Lordship. The reason why many people cannot submit to the Lordship of Yeshua is that their own will is still strong. Their own agenda is still strong. Their own purpose is still strong. Their own perspective is still strong. The Lord said, the day you allow me to possess your will, and then your will is no longer pursuing its fleshly desires, but is totally, completely committed to doing, to knowing, and to doing my will by my grace, that is the day everything changes. Everything changes. A lot of people are do they do a lot of good. Unfortunately, the good they do is not necessarily his will. A good idea may not be a God idea. It may sound nice, but it's in the will of Elohim. Whatever we do, no matter how wonderful it is, no matter how great and mighty, if it is not a function of his Perfect will, not permissive will. Perfect will, that which is his determinate counsel. That which is his determinate counsel for you to discover his will and to walk in his will, to make his will a dwelling place. It changes the dynamics of our life. I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, blessed is the one whose will has been voluntarily laid aside to take on the pursuit of the will of Elohim with everything in you, with everything spirit, soul, and body. Then you begin to listen to his small, still voice. And he guides you, say, this is the way. Follow it. And you are led by Holy Spirit in all things. Marriage, ministry, lifestyle, friends who can be in which circle, and he guides you. When this happens to you, you are in a secure place. Let us pray. But I pray by your spirit that these words will bear fruit, massive fruit in the life of your people. Have your way. Holy Spirit, take over. 
Begin to walk the inner walk right now. Walk in every one, whether it will take a day or an hour or a moment or two days or one week or ten weeks or whatever time it will take. Father, to your people, allow these words to take over their whole being. Lord, we say, right on, we have it. We need you. Even as we start open gate today, we dedicate everything to you. Lord, let your will, your perfect will be done from the very first thing to the very last thing. For those who speak, let them speak by your leading. Those who minister, let them minister by your leading. Let your glory be the prevalent thing that binds us together. We love you, Father. Thank you for answering our prayer. Yeshua's mighty name of prayer. Amen. And amen. Men and brethren, we thank the Father for the opportunity. I, I just want to tell you, uh, in the spirit, I feel the Lord is at work. I, I, I sense brethren pressing in. This is what he talks about, the kingdom suffering violence, the violence taken by force. I know there are a lot of interpretations, but this particular interpretation is about pressing into a truth that is declared. You receive it and lay hold on it and refuse to let go until the Lord does that work in you. The Father is gracious. We have some bad days today. Bishop Mark Nicholson, 57 today. Pastor, uh, he's in London. Pastor Mary Ogwo is in Germany. She was in master class. And Pastor Alan Benjamin Mills, the president of IMF South Africa. Theophilus Okoro, my brother-in-law. Apostle Diane Chappell, one of the elders at the gate of Detroit, Michigan. Sammy Ellen Trimble and a, a prophetess Sandra Villarreal, I think she's in Trinidad and Tobago. Today's a bad day. Deborah Boyd, today's a bad day. Pastor Michael Pearson, today's a bad day. Wow, so many. And Pastor Prince Blessing Chick is here in New Zealand, all the way in New Zealand. Today's a bad day. And it's us awesome. Bad day. And our sister Robin Ware. You know what? We're going to pray for them on day break with the king. Thank you, elect. Oh, we're going to be seeing from the open gate, we're going to be streaming on this and many other channels, but this is going to be the primary channel. So stay tuned from today. Uh, you know, after dinner, we're going to be switching on for the opening segment about 7 p.m. UK time, something like that. So about that, about 2 p.m. Eastern time, 1 p.m. Central time, about that kind of time, just begin to tune into this uh, uh, channel and you're going to be enjoying and tonight you're going to hear the keynote and message for uh, the open gate uh, by dr cosmos electrical chairman of global governing council a brother we love so much he and his wife uh, dr adiola you know so stay tuned and all through the weekend we're going to have beautiful times with one another with a lot thank you elect <music>